Welcome to First Friday. For more than 30 years, St. Thomas alumni and friends have come together for the First Friday Speaker Series luncheons to hear firsthand from the community's most interesting thought leaders. Now, we're delighted to share these conversations both online and in person. The leaders we invite to this series offer candid messages and unique perspectives on the common good and provide powerful insights into what may be next for Minnesota and beyond. Earlier this month, we had the opportunity to welcome Soledad O'Brien, an award-winning documentarian, journalist, speaker, author, and philanthropist into our multimedia studio for a discussion on courage in journalism, working in today's media environment, and making a difference in the world. Soledad has anchored shows on CNN, MSNBC, and NBC, and she's hosted projects for Fox and A&E. She has contributed to the three major broadcast networks, Oxygen, National Geographic, the PBS NewsHour, and WebMD. She was a special correspondent on Al Jazeera America's news program, America Tonight, and produced several documentaries on social issues for the network. She's also the CEO of Soledad O'Brien Productions, and she currently anchors and produces the Hearst television political magazine program, Matter of Fact with Soledad O'Brien. She also reports regularly for HBO's Real Sports with Bryant Gumbel. Hosting the discussion is a very special St. Thomas alumna and journalist, Georgia Fort, class of 2011. Georgia is a two-time Emmy-nominated journalist. Her reporting has been published on CNN, ABC, NBC, Fox, and CBS affiliates. In 2021, she joined the Racial Reckoning, the Arc of Justice Project, she also founded Black Press Center for Broadcast Journalism, a nonprofit online site based in St. Paul that publishes news and other content about the black experience in America. She was an associate producer for PBS Frontline's American Voices. She has worked as a field producer for the NBC Today Show Online and was co-director of Amazon Prime's Rondo, Beyond the Pavement. She recently launched Here's the Truth with Georgia Fort, a weekly half-hour television show designed to bring her award-winning reporting to television. In honor of her many accomplishments, Georgia will be honored with this year's Spirit of St. Thomas Award. We deeply appreciate Soledad and Georgia sharing their insights for this first Friday program. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Welcome to First Fridays. I'm independent journalist Georgia Ford, and I have the honor to be here with Soledad O'Brien. For those of you not familiar, Soledad is a former anchor of CNN, MSNBC. She started her own production company where she now produces Matter of Fact with Soledad O'Brien. And recently you produced an amazing documentary on Rosa Parks. You've won so many accomplishments and- More, more, don't <laughs> yes. stop, Georgia. Just let's keep going. You know, honestly, I couldn't think of a better person who exemplifies courage in journalism. Oh, you're so kind. And when you talk about courage in journalism, I think oftentimes people think about instances where your physical safety is in jeopardy, but sometimes it takes courage just to simply tell the truth. Can you, in your own words, share with us how you define courage in journalism? I think it depends kind of on where you are in your career and your life. Um, I think it's always about trying to do the right thing, right? Like to me, that's a little bit of the, the North Star, like making sure that you're, you're doing the right thing. Um, so sometimes it is, I mean, I covered uh, this earthquake in Chile where I, I don't speak, my, my mom is Cuban, but my Spanish is really like Spanglish. And um, we were chasing people because they were breaking in and, and it was one of the rare earthquakes where everyone just started looting um, wow. buildings that didn't get damaged at all. And so they weren't stealing things that they needed in the wake of the earthquake. I mean, people, there was a guy running with um, a, a box of like key blanks, you know, those things that mm -hmm. you're going to make, <laughs> like, yeah. why are you stealing the key blanks? So anyway, so my Spanish is not really good enough to like ask that question. Yeah. With, so I said to him, you know, like, why are you stealing? And he said something, and I couldn't understand it. My producer, who's also running with me to chase, you know, going with everybody, um, I turned to her, I said, what did he say? She said, he says, if you don't leave him alone, he's gonna kill you. Wow. <laughs> I'm like, oh, lo siento. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, like I think there is some courage, right, in chasing yeah. people down and trying to get the story, certainly. Um, but I think, you know, probably the more typical kind of courage is where you 
ask the awkward question. You hold people accountable. Sometimes that's your own bosses. Um, you stick up for somebody who's not really in a position to defend themselves. You stick up for somebody who's not in the room to defend themselves. Um, you know, I think all those things are kind of definitions of a of a kind of courage. And I think when I've been in this business like 35 years, so you no get, way. <laughs> I mean, five years, and you get to the point, right? You you know, the the, the longer you're in, and I'm self-employed, you. I think it's easier to have courage to do some things because, you know, you you don't you you just put the time in. Uh, so often I have to advise younger journalists, like you know, maybe this is not the moment to be super courageous. What are right. the things that you can do? Sometimes keeping your mouth shut, watching very carefully, is a really good strategy as well. Yeah, absolutely. Has there ever been a time where you needed to be brave, but it was challenging to find the courage? Um, you know, I think. Um, when we were shooting our doc series for CNN Black in America, so that was 2012, so what's that, 11 years ago? Gosh, it's crazy. Um, I remember the first version of that doc was dark and depressing. Mm. And I didn't know what to do because I felt like black people are not depressing. Mm. And I kept saying to the producers, but like if you actually know any black people, we would all be laughing around this table, right? We'd be, the, the, they're the best comedians. They make the best food. The, like, they're great entertainers, you know? Yes. So, but this, this thing reads about statistics. Yeah. And, and those are important, but they're not everything. And I couldn't quite figure out, like, so how do we tell a really good story and an accurate story that's accurate on, on all fronts and we, and we get it right? So I was kind of panicking because, you know, um, I just felt like there's not that many black people working on this. That would be me, you know. Yeah. So, and I'm the anchor of it. So, um, for good or for bad, I'm going to get the credit and the blame. And I, I, I rewrote a lot of it with um, the president of the news division. Actually, I would sit and bring it with him, you know, to, with me to his office, and we would sit down and just rewrite it because I'm like, I'm trying to. This is just not capturing it. It was very stressful. I didn't feel like I was being courageous. I was actually just kind of panicked. Because, you know, my best friend, a black woman who was a producer, you know, she was sort of like, this is important to get right. Um, you got to get it right. And I felt a certain amount of pressure. It was like a six-hour doc, the first one CNN or anybody had really done. So um, I wouldn't say I felt courageous. I felt like there was a high potential I could pick it up, and I didn't want to do that. Yeah. And I think one thing that did, a really good outcome out of that, outside of we actually turned out a great doc and we fixed it, um, I really learned that, as cheesy as it sounds, like the buck stops here. You know, the, I would rather go down in flames around a mistake that I made, that I could sit here and say, well, George, here's what I did. Here's what I was thinking. It, I, may have, I made a, a bad decision, but it was my decision. I thought it was right, but I will never go down in flames because, well, so-and-so told me to say it. Well, so-and-so wrote it, so I read it. Like, I will never do that. And that experience really solidified that for me. Yeah. I don't mind being wrong. I'm happy always to be corrected, but I won't just take somebody else's framing and words for that's it. Right. And that was a really good lesson. I don't know that that's courage. I think it was for, it felt like a lot like fear actually. Um, but I guess not, not just a, being like, well, it's not really me. It's not really my fault. You know, that was just not gonna happen. Yeah, owning it. Yeah. Taking the initiative, having integrity. Right. I think most people in the journalism industry dream of one day being on CNN or MSNBC. Where did you find the courage to step out and launch your own company? Um, I had a boss who didn't want me to anchor. He made it really clear. And in a weird way, it was kind of a favor. It was it, because what usually happens if you're an anchor is um, your bosses say, listen, we're going to move you off of this but we think you're amazing. And we have oh, like a whole bunch of interesting things you're gonna do, right? And six months go by and you're like, huh, that's, that's weird. This didn't really materialize. You go back in and they say, oh no, no, we love you. And we have, oh, we're gonna have you do all these, right? And then a year goes by and you're like, oh, oh, I guess this wasn't true. And he said to the get-go, he's like, I don't like you anchoring. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take you off your show. And I'm going to put another woman in who's uh, younger. And he liked boy-girl. So he put two people in to do my show, neither of whom are doing the show anymore. And, um, and so it was just really clear. And I, it was both like a little harsh, but also like, OK, 
he said he wanted me to to be a fill in, so I'd fill in for Anderson or anybody else's show. And I was like, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm at a place where I need to be the fill in. That might be great for some people, but this was ten years ago, and my kids were relatively little still. So a fill-in schedule with little kids is kind of hellacious. Um, a regular schedule is kind of hellacious, right. so a fill-in schedule is really insane. So I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't think I need to do that. And I felt like I was making a really well-informed decision because I've been in the other circumstance. When I worked many years ago at NBC, I was a producer trying to um, get an on-air job or even just try to get promoted further as a producer. And I had a boss, literally, who used to every six weeks – be like, come, I'll come back and we'll talk about it. I see great things for you. And I used to, I mean, by the fourth time, right? I was yeah. like, this is not real. Right. And in fact, the next time I went to his office uh, to chat with him, he's like, we, I have, I just, you know, project came across my desk and I think it really could be a good fit for you. And I said, oh, no, no, I'm here to tell you I'm quitting. <laughs> I'm leaving. I live, you know, because by then it was literally the fourth time. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you figure it out eventually. And so... I've always tried to take like what was the good from kind of an a, a awkward, unpleasant situation and could in fact I launch something that I that I wanted to launch on my own. And I, I felt like the time was right. I had made a lot of money at CNN and I'd saved a lot of money. And so I, I knew I was, you know, I had the financial wherewithal as well to be able to rent space and hire people and build a company and figure it out. And I'd have a pretty long lead time to do that. And then CNN was my first client. They hired me to do a bunch of docs kind wow. of as I was walking out the door. So that ended up working out really well. But, you know, it, it, again, I, I, I never think of it as courage. I think of it as, um, I think I'm resilient. I think I'm a person who, if plan A doesn't work, you know, we move to plan B. Plan B is not working, we move to plan C. My mom used to say, um, you take 24 hours, you know, and cry if you need to, but the 25th hour, get up and start making a list. She was a list maker and I'm a list maker. And I do. I will sit there and boo-hoo. And this was, by the way, about work or about a terrible boyfriend or about whatever, right? And hour 25, though, you pull yourself together and you start saying, okay, where do I want to live? What do I want to do? What are the qualities I'm looking for in a boyfriend? Or whatever it is. And you kind of just move on. And, and I think I've always been pretty good about that. Like, wow, that sucked. But what are we doing tomorrow? That's right. Keep moving forward. Keep it moving. Yeah. It's so inspiring to hear how you went back that fourth time and you found your value and you made a decision to redefine success for yourself. I'm embarrassed I didn't go back the second time and find my value. I literally kept going back. Well, it takes time. It does. And when you're young and you have this dream of having a career a certain way, sometimes it's difficult to pivot and think about other possibilities, right? But you've done that with launching your own company and launching your show and doing it your way. What do you say to St. Tommy's who are watching this and they're interested in going into uh, journalism or they're interested in starting their own business? What do you say to them as they're trying to find their way? I think resilience is, uh, is a real skill and it's a learnable skill. You don't have to be born with it. You can just practice it and you can force yourself into it. I'm a big list maker and I like to plan out what I'm doing today, what I'm doing this week, what I need to get accomplished this month, how I'm doing for the first half of the year. We just wrapped the first quarter. And, you know, like, like I really try to kind of figure that stuff out all the time. So sticking on, you know, on, on my list is really important for me. Um, I think that helps you not really get thrown off your path. And I would also say it's a great opportunity to gather skills, like just instead of talking about it. Nowadays, everybody has a cell phone, right? And a, a TV quality phone. When, when the pandemic happened, I was shooting real sports for HBO. They gave us three cell phones. Wow. And we shot. <laughs> and, and by the way, you're sh setting it up, rolling it, and doing the interview like, <laughs> by yourself because no one's allowed to be next to you. It was very stressful, but those were iPhones, and the show looked amazing, and yeah. the audio was great. Like, it wasn't impossible. So often I think if you're 20-something and this is something you want to do, you could be practicing yeah. every day. Now, maybe every day is a lot, but you certainly could have a four-minute show on. You could have an in your own interview show. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got the Kim Kardashian ring light somewhere, yeah. right? And you could have, if your dream is to be doing an interview show, you could be doing an interview show right now. 
interviewing your neighbors and say, I'm going to deliver four minutes once a week shot on your iPhone, single camera or even dual camera and just edit it because everybody who's young now knows how to edit. That's right. Right. So we didn't have any of that. Yeah. I mean, I'm older than you, but like my generation TikTok certainly. Made it possible. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and so I feel like it's all about um, saying, what can I leverage? And that doesn't mean that that show is going to hit it big. But it does mean that when you get an interview, you're going to say, well, I mean, I've actually been been doing an interview show. I interview my neighbors and I'm I'm interested in birds, so I'm doing it on birds. I, I love track and field, so I've been, you know, doing the history of track and field, right? And all of a sudden the interview is like, really? So what have you learned? Tell me about it. Yeah. Like you move yourself from here you are in the field with everybody to like, oh, you're doing it? Because when you do it, you start learning those things that you don't know. You, you're immediately above everybody else who's just talking about doing it. And now you have the tools to do it. So, you know, you want to do a podcast? Go to a podcast. Send it out to your mom, your dad, two cousins, <laughs> and a yeah. friend. Like, you can do a podcast about anything. So I, I do think I would tell the students, like, this is the time to explore within, of course, the time limits because they're studying, obviously, um, and grow their skills. Yeah. Um, back in the day, I had to like talk photographers into shooting with me and, and you know, and, and borrow people in order to get something laid down on, on, on tape as we had. So I, I think there's a lot of opportunity. Start where you are, use what you got, do what you can. And knock it out, like do it, you know? I mean, I, I talk to a lot of people about it, but most people don't do it. Yeah, most people don't right. go knock out a podcast. Again, and I'm not saying you have to do a 90-minute podcast three times a week. I'm saying Just you start. can do a four-minute podcast. Yeah. And you might say, well, four minutes is way too long. Or you might say four minutes ended up being too short. Yeah. Just do it. You will learn so much. And again, I when I when we interview inter like none of anybody who's working for my production company, which is tiny, I don't hire anybody who can't edit. Yeah. I, I mean, all the people I'm interviewing and hiring are have really good skills. So you need to move yourself out of that group and and have something more to talk about. That's right. Well, you and your husband, Brad, both value education. You launched a foundation, Powerful. Tell us what, from your standpoint, what do you think is, go is going to take in order for us to eliminate some of the disparities that we see in education, specifically in black and brown communities? I do not know. I really don't. I wish I could see, like, listen, it's three things, and if we can just solve them by the end of the week, you know, it, it, it's not. It's just so complicated, yeah. right? It's because these things are all so intersectional, yeah. right? And and I don't know. I mean, for us, I just felt frustrated. I would meet young women, and they were $6,000 short to go to college. And I was like, well, I can raise $6,000, right? And then we could send that person to college. Yeah. And and so we started kind of just doing that and, and knocking it out for young women who I thought had tremendous potential and could do well and, and get it done. Um, we used to joke, you know, you're going to graduate or we will all die trying and we may all die trying. Um, and, and they need a lot of mentoring and they need, you know, most cases it, it was the money, but also it was a lot of this, just the support, you know, a lot of, as you know, people from, um, black and brown communities, I remember they would just, you know, not want to tell you that they had failed a class yeah. or, and I'm like, oh, everybody fails statistics. Let's take it again over the yep. summer. It's not, you know, it's. It's not and, the end of the world. Right. And they yeah. would come to me saying, I think I need to drop out of college. I don't mm. belong here. You know, I failed statistics. I'm like, yeah, I failed statistics too. No. That's why I am not a statistician, <laughs> by the way, if that wasn't clear, right? So, so let's take it again. Yeah. And let's make sure we have a tutor this time and make sure we're not overburdened with classes uh, so that we can focus on it because yeah. it's obviously not, you know, it's solvable. And I would so many times meet students and you just feel like, well, I just, I'm just done. Can't do it. I'm like, everything's solvable. So um, I think we just, from a practical standpoint, felt like, well, we can do this where we are to help these young people. And, um, and it's been really fun to see how well they've done and what they're doing. And, and just their, you know, I sort of had this idiotic idea. And because your kids are little, you probably do too. Like you send them off to college and you're like, I love you. Goodbye. <laughs> you graduated. Yeah. You know, and now I like, I saw girls come and stay with me. And <laughs> they're 25, 20, you know, they're, they're with you forever. And yeah. you get to go on to the next stage of their careers yes. with them. Um, That's beautiful. It is. It's amazing. It's, it's really amazing and, um, and really worth it. 
Absolutely. And circling back to journalism, um, when we look at the state of the industry right now, I think... Can I take this moment to slam my head into the table? Because it's, I, think it's a, <laughs> I think it's a bad state of the industry, yeah. or at least a very yeah. worrisome state mm -hmm. of the industry right now. Elaborate on that. Well, um, first of all, I don't, I'm not even sure what, you know, what we're counting as, as news. Um, I think we have a lot of misinformation. I think we have a lot of disinformation. I think social media has, which I love social media, but I think it's made everybody, even the most staid um, legacy organizations, feel like they have to compete. And they do. They're competing for eyeballs, right? So that means headlines become a little more deceptive and more over the top. And Sensationalized. More, yeah, just, you know, absolute craziness sometimes. So um, so I don't know. I, I, I think... There's just a, a lot of things in the industry that just feel like it's a, a bit of a, a scary, weird, weird, weird time. If you had to summarize why there's a lack of trust, I know you just touched on a whole lot, the misinformation, sensationalized headlines, all of these different elements. But what do you think is the key factor in why the trust is eroding for media? Many years ago, um, CNN, I think they created online this um, breaking news button, basically, right? It would do, give you an alert to your phone. And I remember one of the, it was really helpful, but one of the early alerts was that Britney Spears had cut her hair, right? Mm. And you're kind of like, I, I think things like that, right? Yeah. They just start whittling away. I'm not sure that falls in the, oh, breaking news from this big multinational <laughs> organization. Right. Britney cut her hair. I, I think trust is all about continuing to serve a community, yeah. you know, representing that community, showing up all the time, um, really explaining things, like thinking about your audience as people you're trying to serve and help, um, calming fears, not necessarily fanning flames and calming them by explaining, like, let's explain what is happening here because this thing is, is scary and we just need to understand it. And so I, I think they'll, you know, as you can tell from that long list, like a lot of people fail at that. Um, so I often describe it like, you know, a bad boyfriend. I know I'm talking a lot about boyfriends, and I've literally been married for like 30 <laughs> years. But um, a boyfriend. It's a good analogy. It's a good analogy. Everybody but, can relate. Right. A boyfriend, you know, someone who says to me, you know, baby, you got to trust me. Like, no, you actually have to just be trustworthy. Mm hmm you no, you're, no one's going to believe someone who talks about how trustworthy they are. They just have to be trustworthy. You just have to show up in communities. You just have to make sure you're reflecting people's stories. You have to make sure you're there consistently. You have to care about the community you're covering. So you have to think about who you're leaving out of that community frequently. So, uh, you know, I think there's an, an actually quite an easy solution to that. Um, the model of two people sitting on air yelling at each other, I don't mm -hmm. think is a model that builds trust because we all know that drama um, sells, um, outrage sells. So it just kind of fans flames. I don't think it explains things to people. You know, I, I, so I don't think people should be surprised when their ratings fall or um, people don't really trust them because they don't feel like they're being served. They're, they're right, they're not being served. Did the state of the industry inspire you to start your company, or is it informing your approach to storytelling? It really has informed our approach to Matter of Fact, um, which is our syndicated show. We started that show eight seasons ago with um, politicians who are based in Washington, D.C., and we'd interview, you know, talking head politicians. And pretty quickly, we stopped doing that for a couple of reasons. We would shoot the show on Thursday to air on Sunday. And, and um, in 2016, when President Trump was president, there was so much, like, uh, turnover in terms of like storylines. You know, he'd say one thing and then 12 hours later he'd say the opposite. And so I was finding that a lot of our interviews were just getting dated because so much had happened. But in, in all fairness, you couldn't put someone on the air to talk about something that they were interviewed about on Thursday, on Sunday. Mm -hmm. You know, it just I wouldn't do that because 10 more things had happened since that interview. So um, so that happened. And then we also found that we we had this opportunity to kind of go straight to the horse's mouth. Like, I don't need to go to the middleman. That's the lawmaker who's going to tell me all. And, you know, they they want to talk about what they're doing. Well, I proposed a law. I'm, I've got legislation. You know, where, as opposed to if you want to talk, do a story on homeless moms and go find some and ask them the tough questions that you're interested in. 
we did a, we do a lot of work, you know, our, our whole show is about politics, but really sort of public affairs and, and policy. You know, when you want to talk about the housing crisis, you go find someone in the middle of the housing crisis and talk to them about what they're doing. And I've interviewed lots of people about, you know, the high cost of insulin. And, and I can tell you, for those three particular stories that I'm thinking of, I have no idea the politics of the people. Like, we did not talk about, you know, well, listen, are you left or right? Uh, it was just like, here's the issue. Yeah. And it was an issue for a lot of people that kind of crossed any kind of political line. So we, we never were yelling at each other. We never were debating it. They were telling me about their experience, which was quite interesting. I think a lot of our stories are just stories people don't see in other places. We did a story for on housing for with a young man who's not Mexican, but who was living in San Diego. But the housing got so expensive. He moved to Mexico. He lives in Mexico. He walks. He's an American. Walks over the bridge every day to his job, full-time job, and walks back and paying a quarter of what he was paying in rent because he can save money this way. Otherwise, there was no place for him in San Diego. And it was a really good vehicle to explore that issue without it being like, Senator Jones says, you know, you're lying. Senator Smith says you're lying, you know, like, which is not helpful, I don't think. So I think it really started to inform our show and sometimes we'd make mistakes. I remember we did a story about, you know, millennial voting. And I was like, we need a millennial. We, we had a great guy who had done a lot of research on millennials, but he was like my age, you know? And all of a sudden we looked at each other, like we want to ask the question, why are you not voting? Yeah. You didn't vote. Tell me why you didn't vote. And what would it take to get you to vote, right? I mean, so you kind of need a millennial. And we've gotten much better about who we want to hear from. And I think those folks are you know, obviously extremely informed on their own lives and their own experiences and are always happy to share them and don't, you know, you can go to a Native American reservation and talk to Native Americans, right? You don't That's need right. to hand the mic to, you know, the, the lawmaker who's representing this group or the reporter who's standing in front of this group. Like, just ask people. And so I think we've done a very good job on that and our ratings have been excellent on that show. Uh, you know, I think we're the number one public affairs show now. Um, and congratulations. Thank you. And, um, and also, you know, we started with about 195,000 households and we're just under 2 million now. Like that's wow. a, but it's like steady, it's incredible. but I, I think we just keep doing the same thing. It's been eight years, right. Of like, and Being we do consistent. some things that are like, so what is the first amendment or, um, when the president is sworn into office, what exactly does he swear to? I mean, those are not the kinds of stories that you'd be like, whoa, yeah, I yeah. have a pitch for you, right. you know, but, but people, they're, they're, they're conversations that are happening and we say, whoa, whoa, whoa. So let's step back for a minute. Here's what you need to know to be informed and be in all these other conversations. Like we can help with that. And that's, that's work. So I, I think it's why we have a lot of credit. We, our, our age of our viewer is about probably seven years younger then the you know the CNN viewer or the C the Fox viewer is quite an old viewer, and uh, we have more women, women of color. You know I, why? Because we do stories about women of color. We don't say. And now, uh, you know, on this Black History Month, a story about a right. woman of color. We just do them. That's you know, right. and and again, I think maybe year one people don't get it. Year two, they might be like, "Huh, that's interesting." You know, by year eight, if you just keep doing it, I think you prove yourself to be trustworthy, and also, you know. We are, are the, the shows that carry, right? They're affiliates. They're all over the country. So we don't just do LA and New York. New York would be amazing. I wouldn't have to ever go anywhere because I live in New York. But well, there's a lot of stuff that's happening. I mean, we were just doing a story in Florida on the lack of firefighters this, this week. We did, um, we do a lot of stories. My, my producer is from Milwaukee. So we do a lot of stories. Wisconsin always finds its way into our <laughs> stories. We do a lot of stories out of North Dakota. Every other place I've ever worked, there has not been some plethora of stories out of North Dakota um, about what's happening with their hospital system, you know, things like that. So I, I think it's just about, my boyfriend analogy is a good one. You just gotta keep showing up in a That's trustworthy right. way. And then all of a sudden, 12 years in, somebody says, you know, they are trustworthy. Absolutely. So, Lynette, most people don't really understand what it takes to produce something of that caliber and the sacrifice and the dedication that it takes to produce a show uh, year after year, right? Walk us through your drive. What is your why? What impact do you hope to have with your show? 
I, I love that you describe it as sacrifice, but I have to say, you know, it's, it, I have a great team. And when you have a great team, your sacrifices are less and less. I get up in the morning, I go to the gym, I work out, I go horseback riding, and then I start my day. And those are the things I do for my own, like, mental sanity. But I, I think for me, sort of around the time of Hurricane Katrina, I began to figure out that journalism could be about service. You know, and if you started thinking about how do you, how do you help this community understand this thing? What are the questions that they have? How do you make sure you're reflecting? In, you know, who are you leaving out in the community? Because this community is made up of a whole bunch of people, a bunch of them who you're not interviewing. In fact, a bunch of little pockets that you didn't even realize were there. How do you make sure that you're, you're getting to them? And how do you hold yourself accountable to that? You know, so I think, like, for me, that's kind of the why. And I think when I started, it was, you know, I'm making $11,000 a year. How do I get to 15? How do I get to 25? Um, boy, I really would like this job. How do I get assigned to this so I can shine and go do that? You know, and then at some point you sort of grow up a little bit and say like, how do I, you know, everybody seems to have this misconception about this. We should do a story about this. How do I explain this issue? How do I, how do I talk about for our doc series on HBO, Black and Missing? Like, mm -hmm. why does law enforcement and the media not care about brown and black girls who go missing? Like, we should explore that and have tough conversations about it, you know? And, and so I'm, I'm lucky because I get to do it. I, I don't know that I'd call it a sacrifice. I feel really fortunate that, you know, everybody, we can usually sell it and someone, then we get to hire a good team around it and we get to, to do it. But, you know, we all think about it. Like, it's something that we've been thinking about and that, you know, we, we think we can do a good job on and it's important and it just hasn't been told before. How has the advancement of technology, specifically with social media, impacted your ability as an independent media owner, as an independent journalist? How has the advancement of technology impacted what you're doing? I love, I love social media. Um, and I, of course, hate social media because it is... Twitter is an absolute cesspool, but it's also a very interesting thing. It's kind of getting messed up right now. Um, so, you know, social media is really helpful, I think, because it allows you sometimes to just get straight to, to specific people you want to talk to. You know, you don't have to put in a call and then talk to that person's representative who might relay to them the thing that you want. You're, you can just talk to people directly and about issues or even just questions or framing. So I've really, really liked it. I do think there is this effort sometimes to be more dramatic because you have to see how that story's, I mean, you see this a lot and I, I can't think of ex specific examples at this moment, but, you know, sometimes I'm tweeting, you know, uh, rapidly because the New York Times headline is just so ridiculous, you know, and then you can, sometimes we've actually been able to get them to, to change the headline, but it's a salacious over the top headline that actually doesn't really match the, the article. Um, so, you know, and I think social media causes that, right? You need to come up with something very dramatic so that you can, yeah, yeah, you can stand out from all the other stuff that people are scrolling through. And so that means you do. You have to make it clickable and kind of over the top. So I think, I think that is 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 bad. Um, but net net, I mean, I, I love social media because I I like seeing trends and stories and issues. And I think social media often, you know, gets that first. There's never been a earthquake in recent times in LA, a little tiny earthquake that suddenly everyone in LA is like, did you feel that? I can always tell. <laughs> suddenly my feet is, did you feel that? Did you feel that? Did you feel that? <laughs> it's all the LA people, you know, chatting amongst themselves about a breaking news story, essentially. Yeah. Um, so I, I find it really helpful, actually. And then, of course, technology generally of things getting smaller and faster. And, um, uh, you know, it's just, again, if you're shooting, uh, if you're trying to tell stories, I think it's, it's pretty amazing. How would you summarize the importance of independent media? You know, I think it's really important um, because, you know, I, and, and it's also a challenge, right? It's hard to raise money. It's hard to, to do all these things without the backing of a big giant company. But I do think you also, you know, independent media really is often out there breaking stories and focusing on things that nobody else cares about at the moment. Uh, let me tell you something. When we did Black and Missing, it, it was right around the, when Gabby Petito went missing. And her mm. dad, he did said the most amazing thing when they started finding bodies as they were looking for this young wow. woman. And, um, and really at his probably worst moment, he said, you know, there are all these other people who need to be found, right? It was just, I mean, imagine, like, their worst moment and the thing you think about is somebody else's child. It was yeah. remarkable. Um, 
But after we did that doc, it got a lot of attention, partly around that case. And then all of a sudden, people started doing stories of black and brown missing people. Yeah. And I was like, dang, we did it. Like, we moved the needle on that. And and I, you know, I, I think sometimes independent media gets to lead on that front and tell people, there are these important stories that you're missing. There's a lot of stuff we don't chase because we don't have to do what everybody else does. That's right. What do you see as the future of news? Oh my goodness, I wish I had a good crystal ball. Um, I'm a big believer in opportunity. You know, there's a lot of students here who are always trying to figure out like, oh, it's a tough job market. What, you know, is this good or bad? Well, I have a good job, is there a future? And I think there's an amazing future because I think there's just a ton of opportunity. And whenever there's, I had a boss once who said, you know, there's opportunity in chaos. And I think we're in a lot of chaos. And I think that means there is opportunity, but that means honing your skills so that you're ready to jump into whatever it is that, pops up in, in a moment. When I was interviewing for my very first job, somebody said to me, well, you know, the evening news is dead. And I'm, yeah, so that was 1987, as far as I can tell, at least from last night, the evening news was very much alive. The person anchoring it was making goo gobs of money, right? Like, so there are always these mythologies around, ah, oh, this is dead, this is dead. It's just often not true. So if I had believed that person and thought, oh, the evening news is dead, well, they couldn't have been more wrong. That was a person, by the way, in the newsroom interviewing me for my first job. The evening news is not dead. And news is just going to shift and change. And so make sure you have all these skills and lots of flexibility so you can shift and change with it. You're not going to look up and say, oh, I'm utterly unprepared for this, this major change, this major you know, turn. If you could say anything to your younger self, let's say the Soledad who walked into her boss's office for the first and the second time, what would you say? Well, so my hair and your hair, we have very similar hair. And I would say, Soledad, do not do that bob cut because our <laughs> hair cannot handle a bob cut, that. right? The triangular. That. So that would be the first thing I would say. I'd be like, don't do it. Just, you know what? Don't do it. Um, I would say net, learn to network earlier and more. Um, I would say uh, trust yourself. It took me a while to learn to like trust my voice and trust myself. And doing that was a really smart thing. You know, I, I know, and I, we all know, you know, what the kind of way we want to tell a story. We all know when someone's BSing us. We all know when someone's not a good person and not appropriate, you know, and just being more confident in believing that. Um, and then, you know, maybe be more forgiving about mistakes. You know, go back and learn again. Try to, you know, figure stuff out. Um, and then probably I would, um, I'd be more forgiving of other people's mistakes. One thing I did years ago, which I wish I hadn't done, uh, my very first job at WBZ TV, I used to be in the morning meeting and I did the, I did the show that came on before the Today Show. I was an associate producer. And that show would end at 7.00 when they would toss to the Today Show. So I would get the scripts, throw them out, and run to the bathroom, and then do the morning meeting. There was a guy in that morning meeting, who shall remain nameless, who was always awful to me. Mm. He used to say, oh, because I'd come in late every day. Whoa, she's running on colored people's time. Mm. Oh, yeah, like, I mean, he was awful. And I would go home at night and be like, so when he says that, I'm going to say this. Sometimes I'd be like mad. Other times I'd be like, I need you to stop saying that. I would tell other people, they just tell it out, you're taking it so seriously. It's just a stupid joke. But it just drove me crazy. And I would strategize around when he does this, I'm gonna, here's a comeback I've got. I'm going to do this. I'm gonna. Then I, I left that station. I love working there. I got a job at NBC News and I left. I haven't seen him again in mm -hmm. 35 years. Mm -hmm. What a waste of time. Energy. Right? Brand. Literally, I could have been working on my career as opposed to coming up with snappy comebacks when this guy said something to me. You know, and so it's like a really good lesson is don't, don't be waylaid by the stupid stuff. Don't be waylaid by that person who's pick, 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 picking at you. You know who that is. Don't be just like move on and go and be successful. Do the things that you want to do. I never, I, I mean, you know, TV news is such a small business. In 35 years, you think I would have bumped, at least bumped into him somewhere. Nope. Never saw him again. What a waste of my time to be derailed by just stupidity. I don't, will never do that again. Well, we are here in the Twin Cities, which has been the epicenter of a global movement following the murder of George Floyd. And in terms of stories, I think that there have been examples of phenomenal 
powerful stories that have come out of the Twin Cities following the murder of George Floyd. And then there have been some stories where we see that there's a lot of opportunity for our industry to go. The one thing I think that remains constant is the importance to document things, especially because we're living in a time where there is this fight to remove our history from classrooms. What has it been like for you as a storyteller living through this era, which feels like in 20 years is going to be a very pivotal and historical time for America. You and I will be interviewed, right? When they're doing docs about this time, we'll be sitting down doing interviews. So um, I live in the state of Florida. <laughs> so, you know, you want to see all kinds of crazy things. Like we are the epicenter of, of that craziness. Um, you know, our doc, um, The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks, is, you know, that's one of the, there's a book based on it, and that book is banned, you know, because, as you know, Rosa Parks' story, um, they kind of want to remove all the race stuff out of it, which is a very big part of the Rosa Parks story. Mm -hmm. um, it's a crazy time, and I agree with you. I think the best defense is always more documentation, more storytelling, more tracking. It'll be interesting, right? Um, I, I don't know when this is going to air, but as of this taping, CBS is about to do an interview with Marjorie Taylor um, Brown, Green, mm -hmm. <laughs> Brown, uh, mm -hmm. Green. And from the promos, it doesn't look like it's going to be a very challenging interview just from the way they've been framing the story in the promos. Who knows? It hasn't aired yet at this moment, so who knows? You know, but I think like that to me is where we get to show, are we good journalists? Or are we just hacks, right? Like, are you challenging somebody who's done a lot of really crazy against democracy things on the record and quoted on camera? It's not like some deep, um, you know, deep non-known research I'm giving you. So, you know, I think we have a lot of opportunities to constantly just call stuff out. I don't know. Maybe it'll be an amazing interview. Maybe it'll be really challenging and smart. I mean, they certainly have great journalists there. Or maybe it'll be like it feels from the promos, kind of, you know, a puff piece. We'll, we'll find out. But I think journalists have a chance to hold themselves and others accountable to doing, you know, good, fair reporting on these stories. And now more than ever, we have to be willing to stick up and say, that was bad. This is good. There's a lesson in this for journalists who are coming around now, and, and we have to do better. And I think there, for a long time, you know, people don't like to call out their colleagues. I don't mind. I don't mind. If something's bad, it's bad. For some of the St. Thomas students who are watching, aspiring going into the journal journalism industry, what would you say are some of the traits of a good journalist? Got to be able to write. Right, right, right. Learnable skill. Everything is learnable. So, you know, if you're not, a, if you're a terrible writer, then start now because you'll be a good writer in two years. Just write all the time. Do a first draft, a second draft, a third draft. Read other people's great writing and try to figure out, so how do they structure that story? Like exactly how did they do that? Because when you start watching, for example, a Dateline story, there's a, there's a, there's a rhythm to it, right? Sometimes they start in the middle. It was a night like any other night, right? And we're going to start. And then, then by the end of that first block, you know, within within an hour, Susie would be dead, right? There's a, there's a you know, so it's like a, a D, start with a D block, and then you go to A because they say, you know, 12 years ago, it, you know, it was a whole different, you know, like that's how they structure the story. So you, you watch enough of those and you're like, oh, I see the patterns. There's a pattern here. Right? So the theme in TV news is always start with your best pictures and then start explaining them. So see how people start their stories. How are they doing it? See how the best journalists are doing it. Some people are amazing starts with very quiet video where you'd be like, wow, it's such a boring video and they made it amazing. So there's so much to learn from just watching other people's work and, and how they think about structuring. So write, learn from others, be really flexible, say yes to everything all the time. I think it's really important. You can't go wrong when you're like, yes, I'll volunteer for that. Yes, I'm happy to do that. Yes, I, one of the best experiences I had was um, I volunteered when I was a PA at WBZ TV in Boston to, um, to work on the marathon, Boston Marathon. And um, because I was volunteering, I got to be a producer, right? So believe me that I would talk about my producing skills. I was only a PA. But when I was doing interviews, I'd say, well, you know, I've had, a ch I, I've had a chance to do that very thing that I'm talking about, you know, that I'm interviewing for. The printer broke. 
So we had to write the entire show out by hand with with magic markers, you know. <laughs> so my story ended up being a story of like how we figured it out, handing handwritten notes to the anchors while they had live coverage of the Boston Marathon, right? Like what a great story to tell someone who was interviewing me for a thing that I worked for eight hours back in the day. They didn't pay us, so they gave you pizza and soda at night. But the value of that was so important to me getting, you know, the next gig. So I'd say, just say yes, you know, really volunteer and meet people and learn. And then really recognize that, you know, your, um, your reputation goes with you. It's one of the reasons that you have to constantly care about, is something accurate? Is it how you would say it? You know, is it, is it a mistake that it's your mistake? Because that's really all you have, right? Is your reputation and that's your right. integrity, that's kind of it. So I think if you focus on kind of those things for the, as the biggies, you know, you really are off to a pretty good start. What's the most powerful lesson you've learned in your career? Um, that's a really good question. I've learned so many. Um, when you get fired from a show, usually what happens is you read about it in the New York Times first. You're literally prepping for your morning show, and there it is. Oh, mm. I'm being replaced. <laughs> and, and then someone sends you a note, hey, I don't know if you saw it in paper. And then you have to anchor that show for two more weeks. Mm. There's almost nothing more embarrassing than that, right? Yeah. And yet, you can make it through. You put a smile on your face, you deliver the news, you make everybody around you proud. When that show ends, as it did for me, and I went on to start doing documentaries at CNN, um, I thanked everybody on air, and I left to go take on documentary. Like, but literally the most humiliating thing, to have to sit there for two weeks on a show you have been fired from. It's terrible. But you survive it. You go on to this new thing that you've never done before, and it actually becomes a thing that you become famous for, becomes a thing that allows you to build a career, right? This thing that was this like, oh my gosh, you land somewhere, becomes the thing. And that happens so often. And so you kind of learn like, that wasn't that humiliating. We got through it. And, and I'm proud of how I got through it, right? I got to thank everybody. I had a, 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 a girlfriend of mine, she was one of my producers. And when she left a show, we had bought her a cake. She took off her name tags and she shoved it in the middle of the cake. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Um, like you have an opportunity to to leave in a good way. And, and right. even when it's bad and embarrassing and awful, like you still are teed up to do the next thing. That actually could be the thing that's really important. That's happened to me a lot, a lot. So I think it's pretty typical for people. So I would say, you know, you don't have to boo-hoo about something going wrong. You don't have to boo-hoo about not getting the job or missing something or losing a job, right? Just 24 hours, cry, pick yourself up, start your list. Soledad, this has been incredible. Before we wrap up, what final things do you want to leave people with who are watching? What is the takeaway, the one thing that you want people to remember? I think for me, the thing that has been helpful is to really recognize two things. That there are so many stories everywhere. You know, I think we often don't give credit to the idea that like, Lots of different communities have really interesting stories, and they're not the stereotypical ones that we think. Oh, Native communities, we're going to talk about poverty. Oh, Black community, we're going to talk about crime. Oh, Latinos, we're going to, you know, like, so work harder to figure out what those stories are, you know, because that the one that we all think it is is not accurate, number one. And number two, and I, I spoke about this last night, um, I have a tiny team, and we're very diverse. My directors are all diverse, usually women, always you know, women of color, um, sometimes men of color. But like, clearly, if I can do it with my itty bitty little company, mm -hmm. it's not that hard. That's right. It's just deciding you're going to do it. That's it. It's just deciding. I am actually going to increase opportunities for black female directors and then doing it. That's it. Like, it is not magic. And I know sometimes we're like, oh, the pipeline, and where do we find people? They're findable. In fact, if you need black directors, call me. I've got a bunch. And you can do it. So I would say number two, like, there's no magic in it. You just have to sort of decide. And then number three, I think um, something that took me a long time to learn 
like there's nothing wrong with being very compassionate in your coverage. No, their people are people. They make terrible mistakes. They, and that doesn't mean being biased and being on someone's side. It just means in how you speak about people. When we did Black in America, um, we did a story about a young woman. Her name is Glorious Menifee. What a great name, Glorious Menifee. And her, our story, our doc was about um, Glorious going, trying to get off to college. And I remember the first pass of the script, the producer wrote the first pass, and it was Glorious Menifee's mother is a crack addict and her father is an alcoholic. Mm. And I was like, wow, I would be so embarrassed to have her, like, <sighs> plus that's Glorious's parents' dysfunction. That's not really a description of Glorious. You know, and later a friend would talk to me about asset framing and deficit framing, right? Like we asset frame the people we like. And I've written a million stories. Little Jimmy Smith, he's 12 years old, loves baseball. He wants to be a baseball player when he grows up. Every night he puts his mitt under his mattress because he's trying to soften it up. And he, he just got a paper route because blah, 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 right? Because we imbue him with all of this self-directed goodness. And often when we talk about people of color, especially poor people, right? It's always, ugh, the ghetto, this is dragging them down, this is sucking them under, even things that have nothing to really do with them per se, right? We rewrote, I mean, I had a fight with the producer, we rewrote it to, um, Glorious Menifee is a senior at Capital Preparatory Magnet School. She starts on the uh, Magnet School lacrosse team. She is a B student. She's a peer mentor, right? Like this is what who Glorious is. And we absolutely would get to the story about her mom and her addiction and her dad and his alcoholism. Those were important to her story, but it's not the description of her. And fighting to like shove humanity back into these stories, just like you wouldn't want your kid to be described in a way that was dehumanizing. You know, I think you have to think about that for everybody you're, you're talking about. You know, it's, it's asset framing and deficit framing. And once you start realizing like who's constantly being deficit framed and who do we asset frame, you really can't help but notice it. And I think it's, it's easily solvable. You just have to decide you're gonna change it. And if you're the anchor, you can really change it. Just don't say you won't read it. <laughs> That's right. So let add, this has been incredible. I wanna thank you for your fearlessness, for your courage, for your time today, for sharing your wisdom, your experiences, and your knowledge, and for blazing a trail for journalists like myself. Thank you, thanks for having me, appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely, and thank you for all of those of you who have joined us today for First Fridays.